that you're supposed to fall in love with if you happen to be the kind of person that would fall in love with that kind of person, then he's going to act out a, partic a particular pattern of behavior. And the pattern of behavior is quite identifiable. You could say in some sense the men are competing to be the best man and the women are watching the male competition to, to take the man who wins on the presupposition that he wouldn't win if he wasn't the best man. Women aren't after resources. That's wrong. They're after the factors that predict resources. So what we did was we showed women a bunch of pictures. It was this, say, say several pictures of the same guy. So there was several guys. And each guy was in four conditions. The photo of each guy was in four conditions. Same. One guy was poor and stupid, poor and useless. One guy was rich and useless. One guy was rich and useful. And one guy was poor and useful. So the rich, useless guy had won a lottery and it paid out like $4,000 a month for the rest of his life. So no matter how useless he was, he couldn't squander all of it. He had resources, right? The poor, useless guy, well, we don't even have to define that. Everybody understands that. The rich, useful guy, well, that's easy to understand. The poor, useful guy worked for a non-governmental agency. It was a charity, you know, in a charitable organization. And so he, was, he had high occupational status but low income and that wasn't likely to change. So then we asked women to rate these men on a bunch of different attributes, including personality, but also on dateability, basically, and also on probability of considering a long-term relationship with someone like this. And wealth had no main effect. The only effect was usefulness. So the poor useful guy and the rich useful guy were attractive, more attractive to the women than the two useless guys, regardless of their socioeconomic status. And the women judged the useful guys as higher in openness and conscientiousness, which was pretty smart because openness is basically intelligence and conscientiousness is hard work. And those are the best predictor of socioeconomic success. So yay women, good work. The things that have made women attractive to men across time are the things that are associated with health and therefore reproductive capacity. You want someone who, you know, you can get along with them, but now and then they bite you and you think, oh, that's, that's interesting. You know, I didn't really expect that. And then you go and puzzle over it for a while and you torture yourself about it. And that's one of the things that keeps you really linked into the relationship. The reason for that is that part of the reason that you want the relationship isn't so that you're happy right now. It's so that you can live a high quality life across multiple decades. And so you're looking for someone that you have to contend with, who's going to push you beyond what you already are and who's going to judge you harshly often for your limitations. Now imagine that there's a set of qualities that makes it more probable that you'll get to the top of a dominance hierarchy. Now th that's not that hard to imagine, right? You might think, well, intelligence might have something to do with that. Attractiveness might have something to do with that. Power. We know from studies of chimps, and this is mostly done by Franz de Waal, that, you know, because you might think of a kind of prototypical caveman society that it's like the, the caveman that looks most like a bodybuilder who's the most dominant caveman, but so to speak. But what DeWall found among the chimps was that the chimp who was at the top of the male dominance hierarchy, who remained at the top relatively stably so that he wasn't brutally murdered, say, by two chimps that were below him in the dominance hierarchy, was actually kind of a good leader in some sense, you know. So he got along well with the females in the troop and maybe even attended to their children to some degree. And he wasn't a completely unpredictable tyrant. And if he was like that, then you know, a couple of male chimps would form a coalition and when his back was turned at any moment, then they'd rip him to pieces. And so, so that's really, it's phenomenally interesting because what it suggests is that there's a stable set of characteristics, relatively stable, that are operative within a dominance hierarchy that propels you to the top. Because there are people you admire. You think, well, why are there people that, that you admire? And what does it mean to admire someone? And what it means in some sense is that the effect they have on you is one of wanting to imitate. And you know, human beings, a lot of our knowledge, a tremendous amount of our knowledge, isn't propagated linguistically, it's propagated through imitation. And the probability that we were imitating each other before we developed language is extremely high. And, and so, you know, we're imitating ourselves all the time. So if you admire someone, what that does is hook up, it hooks into your desire to imitate. And that's also part of an, like an in, inbuilt, intrinsic biological process. Okay, now, fine, but that's not exactly what human beings are like. Well, 
How would we come up with the concept of what constitutes perfect? There's hardly anything more perfect than the ability to climb to the top of whatever dominance hierarchy you happen to be put in. Now, one of the things I would say is that women exerted tremendous selection pressure on men to be exactly that sort of creature. So, and I can tell you a little bit of experimental evidence that we have in relationship to that later. Unfortunately, it was an unpublished study because it was an undergraduate thesis. But what the hell else would women select men for? If they had any sense. You know, you want to select a partner. Because, you know, you've heard the idea of hypergamy, right? Women mate across or up dominance hierarchies. There seems to be an employment issue, too. And, I mean, that's a complicated problem because, you know, the, the employment market for people who are less skilled has has been, I would say, in decline, especially on the male end of the distribution. And one of the stats that Farrell cites is that um, three quarters of women will not consider seriously dating an unemployed man, whereas one third of men would have a problem dating an unemployed woman. So there's obviously a gender bias there, and I think there's a reason for that. I, sure. I think that it's grounded in it's grounded in both rationality and evolutionary biology. The evolutionary biology element is that women across cultures tend to mate across and up hierarchies, let's say. That's right. And the, the reason for that, I think, is that they're logically, and this is where the logic comes in as well as the biology, they're looking for a partner that can be of substantial economic utility, practical utility, when they put themselves in the vulnerable position of having a child. Mm -hmm. So then you also have this additional problem is if the employment situation tanks in any serious way, then men become less desirable as partners. And your claim, I guess, in part, is that by filling that void, the government actually contributes to the problem rather than, than addressing it. You know, you could be really, really, really excited and really, really, really nervous, which might happen, for example, if you were going to a job interview and you actually wanted the job. It would be even worse if you went to a job interview and like 30% of you wanted the job because, you know, that's the 30% that wants to develop, and another 30% would just soon fail so that you crawl under your bed at home and stay there with the dust bunnies till you're 40. And, you know, another 25% of you is resentful about the fact that you have to go get a stupid job at all. 